All right, let's um, start the meeting. Um, notes, Aaron, we are starting at 6.01 according to my clock. And I will go to our agenda now that I've got 14 screens open. We will be welcoming someone or a guest from the city of Longmont tonight, but she'll be here shortly. Um, do we need to do any introductions? No. We, all, we all know each other? Oh, yes, except Joanne. We should introduce Joanne. That's right. And Joanne, tell us about you. Hi, gang. I'm the executive assistant at the Longmont Museum, and I'm here because our friend Nicole Blair, who used to do this onboarding, uh, found employment closer to her home. And so Angela and I are, are doing, uh, are reciprocating for each other, um, onboard, onboarding our boards. Um, and I've been with the museum about 27 years. Um, so I've, I've, I've seen AIPP grow up, and um, I love it. I love the program. Thank you. We're really grateful to you stepping up to the plate. Thank you, Joanne. We appreciate you. And I've been, as a longtime Longmont member, I've seen you all over the place. So it's good to see you again. Okay, uh, we've called our meeting to order. We'll do a little quick roll call so um, Aaron can um, read the names and hear the names. We've got Jennifer. How are you tonight, Jennifer? Good. Marsha Martin, our um, wonderful city council member is here. Um, Pamela, you're here. Uh, the esteemed Cindy K Tiger is here, welcome. Uh, Trissa, you're here, right? Is that, did I pronounce it right? I practiced. Um, Andrea, our wonderful Wong, just wonderful, like, Big just say, old, just say old. Come on, Amy. No, I was just. We were actually talking about you've been on the commission on and off for like oh, over twenty years, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's a fan, and Holly, and Aaron, who puts up with our scatteredness to take notes, and then we have Laurel, who just got on. It's nice to see you, Laurel, and Noah. And then Peter joined us, great. And Danielle, you're here as, I know I probably, did I do it right? You said Danielle? Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah you're good. <laughs> tell us again, we wanna make sure. Danielle, just normal, okay. just with yeah. a Y instead of an I. It's beautiful, I love <laughs> Thanks. it. Thanks. And then Joanne already introduced herself. Kim is here. Kim, do you wanna say hello? Well, she is here. And then Pamela, we already got her. Okay, great. So um, do we have Julia yet? No, we don't either. Do we have any other public invited, invited to be heard aside from the person that, if, you, if you've if you looked at your agenda, um, we'll have that. Any other public invited to be heard this evening? Okay, so have you all had a chance to review the minutes from last month? Okay, nope. so do we have additions, corrections, subtractions? I have one question. Sure. On page three, number 7D, Neighborhood Improvement Project Partnership Introduction. There's a sentence in the middle of that first paragraph that I think is incomplete because I didn't understand it. We I will let one of these groups come to in the future. Does anybody know, can fill in the blanks? Us. Come to us. Us? Thank you. So say one more time. Sorry. Page. Page three. three. Number 7D. 7D. About halfway through the first paragraph. Come to says, us. Still ironing out the details. We will likely see one of these groups come to in the future. Come to come to art in public places. Come to us. Okay. okay. Thank you. I have a question. Yes, Peter. Um, back on page two, public art project updates, RSVP. Um, right at the last sentence of RSVP Boston Bridge, I think it should be, it will be a piece that will be visible. I-B-L-E, from Boston Avenue and left hand brewery patio instead of visual. Anybody else have fill in the blanks on that? Make sure that we've got that. 
Angela, you had no, can you fill in the blank for us? No, I know. I'm sorry. I'm balancing. Um, let me get Randy inserted into this meeting um, and just hold the phone for just a second. No worries. I'm sorry. So we don't necessarily have to have Angela. Um, read the sentence again to us, Peter, pretty please. I believe it should read, it will be a piece that will be visible from Boston Avenue and Left Hand Brewery's patio. I think you're correct, Peter. Instead of visual. Okay. It's highly visible. Yes, highly visible. It will be visual from anywhere. It will visible. always be visual. Yeah, you don't need to hide in there as a word person. Good. Okay, other corrections, additions, subtractions. Excellent. So Aaron, thank you so much for your great notes. Two words is nothing. We appreciate your hard work and we would need a motion to approve the minutes. I make a motion to approve the minutes. All right, so Andrea and corrected. Laurel. Did. So one of you, uh, Laurel, will you please make a motion and then Andrea, you second then? Yeah, I'll second oh. it. You want me to say, I, I'll make a motion to accept the minutes as corrected. I'll, and I'll second. Excellent, um, all in favor? Anyone opposed? All right, the minutes are passed. Good work. Um, so um, we're gonna talk briefly tonight. We have new orientation feedback that we've all, that, no, that we have participated, some of us have participated in. Um, mine was six years ago, almost six years ago in July. Um, Angela, you wanna give us some feedback on that? So um, just a quick um, addition to the agenda will be 6.A. And that will be that Julie Stone, who is going to be entering our meeting any second. Uh, Julie Stone is the um, coordinator for all staff professional development and also leads our city in so many ways. And she's gonna to speak to us on behalf of the equity team with the city. So in new, uh, or new commissioner orientation, and those of you, there were actually quite a few who attended that. Um, I'd love to hear your feedback, number one, about how, how well, or if there was any feedback um, of something you'd like to see for that orientation. But the addition uh, was the equity initiative. And this is not new. This is a continued initiative with the city. And so Julie's gonna join us after we do a little bit of the feedback from the commissioners who attended. And she's gonna give us a brief presentation into the continued uh, efforts in equity in all projects throughout the city for our commission. And so then that will mean that all of our commissioners have received this information and going forward as all commissioners come into our uh, commission that they will receive the same training so that we will all be on the same page. And of course, this isn't something that's going to end here, but it certainly is a wonderful introduction. So uh, I think if we can start with just maybe going around the table and anyone who would like to give a, just a brief feedback about their experience with the new commissioner orientation. And then uh, Julie, who has joined us, will we'll pop into her presentation. Excellent. Should we go around the room? Um, well, who's, who would like to, to offer their feedback first? I'll offer mine. I actually found that it, I found it to be very valuable and a lot of excellent information that I really didn't know about how the city functions. Um, one thing that I did find especially enlightening and it, it made me feel like we're really going down the right track is that the, um, it was mentioned that the, the city in general is looking for ways to increase the diversity of all of the commissions. So we know that that's something that we've been focusing on and that's part of our strategic plan, but it was just good to hear that there are other commissions that are feeling the same way and that there's efforts being put into making it a more diverse group of people in general. So yeah, I enjoyed it. Thanks. That's great. That's great. Who's next? Noah? Yeah, I'll jump in. 
Um, I enjoyed the presentation overall. It was some information I knew, but mostly new stuff. Um, and it was nice to kind of uh, meet, for lack of a better term, uh, the people within the city that we could come to with questions and things like that. That's great. It's always nice to have those places to go. You know, I, um, I've been doing this for six years and I really feel fortunate to have, I've learned through experience. <laughs> and I think that if you have that um, background and that, be, that, be, that way to get started is the, the best way to go. Who else would like to give their feedback? Well, I didn't, I didn't see the updated film, uh, but I remember going in person to uh, the meeting back three years ago or whenever. I loved it. And uh, it was so valuable. And yes, I learned a lot about how the city worked. And um, but I, so I, I was fortunate to hear it in person. I liked it a lot. So Laurel, the, um, you're referring to your experience three years ago. At that point, we didn't have the input from the idea of community inclusivity equity. So um, I think you'll be really right. curious to hear some of the stuff that Julie will share with us too. Um, who else would Very like good. to give, oh, Aaron, great. Yeah, I just wanna echo that I was really impressed with Julie's part of the presentation and that fact that the city was taking equity into consideration. And to echo what Holly was saying too, that I was impressed to see that the city is moving to make commissions more diverse and working towards that goal. And it was just very informative and very thorough. That's exciting. Thank you, Aaron. Peter. I, I too did it three years ago. And I would say that the equity um, portion of it was something that was glaringly missing at that point. Mm -hmm. You could look around the room, see who was on the commission, mm -hmm. see who was in the commissioner's uh, orientation. And there's a very obvious large portion of the population that's just not represented there. <clears throat> uh, so are you referring to folks that, uh, you know, the, this is one thing that Angela and I chatted about today and being careful with the language we use. We don't necessarily know people's backgrounds, their ethnic backgrounds, their heritage, where they're coming from, their diversity. But if you're referring to the idea of folks of color, that might be something to think about. So I appreciate that, Peter, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else wanna give their feedback? I was, uh, <clears throat> I really enjoyed the meeting too. And I have been in many, many meetings over my years. And um, the main thing I noticed is that Everyone was very happy to be there and, and they all love living in Longmont, which is says a lot because it's not fun living in a place where people don't want to be. So um, I thought it was great and I'm excited about the diversity part and that there's so much welcoming of us as commissioners of all kinds of participating in the community. So I thought it was great. It's great. Any other final feedback before we move on to let Ju Julie share her um, her expertise in her short presentation this evening? Okay, great, Julie, welcome. We're so glad to have you. And it's so nice to be here and see some familiar faces, quite a few. Hello everyone and nice to see some new faces as well. Um, as Angela said, I'm the training coordinator for the city of Longmont, and I am part of the equity team. We were formed um, about a year and a half ago. We started with a six week training session from the USDN GARE um, group. It's a, a, a group that supports government agencies in, in supporting equity and you know, bringing equity into their communities. And it was from the top down, uh, from our city manager, Harold Dominguez, he was there for all six weeks, as well as every single department director. Um, so a lot of time was invested by people from the top. And then there were a number of us um, also invited for different reasons. And the reason that I was invited was because I'm the training coordinator and obviously um, we knew that, you know, to really make this program successful, there would be a 
big training component to it for staff members. I am not a member of the equity team because I am an expert on equity by any means. Um, I, you know, one thing about this whole experience is that we have to be willing to make mistakes. We have to be willing to possibly say something that others will kind of like go, ooh, what did she just say? It's going to happen. And it's just the nature of this topic. And um, I have been in some of our own groups meetings where people have been a little unwilling, I think, to, to say exactly what happened in a particular scenario or use the exact words that were said. And I have a different take on it um, because I'm not an expert in this field. I like to learn from others. I like to hear what exactly was said that was offensive um, and how did the person reacting to it, you know, what words did they say? I don't like hearing something that's just like, well, you know, try to use some words that will diffuse the situation. I want to hear exactly what those words are so that I can learn. Um, so I'm going to keep this a little quite brief and I'm going to share my screen. I hope I can do this. Um, and this is a presentation that Francie Jaffe put together for the new committee members from all boards. And I'm not gonna go through it in quite as much detail um, as she did, but um, we are gonna talk about how to be an inclusive board. And her first slide here, um, and I know it's small for you on your screen, but I think Angela could probably share this in detail. The message here is that Longmont is a very diverse community. We have different ages and surprisingly, the 65 to 74 year old age range um, is one of the largest in the city and growing. You know, our older population countrywide is growing. We're diverse in age, we're diverse in race, we're diverse in our economic backgrounds. Um, Longmont is growing at a fast pace. It continues to, it has been for a long time. And I think we can just expect that the, the you know, the, the demographics in the city will continue to become more and more diverse. Right now, um, obviously it's, um, we've got about a 25% Hispanic population in Longmont and you know, I would expect that to grow as well as other communities of color, Asian communities and black. Um, and I'm just gonna say with, um, with saying the word black that a year and a half ago when I went through this training, I didn't know that it was okay to say black. I felt like that was kind of like a no-no and you were supposed to say African-American. But, um, <clears throat> what I've learned through this is that, you know, saying black is fine. And if someone that you meet uses African-American instead of black, it's okay. You know, not everyone will have gone through as much education around diversity and equity as, as we. Um, so we have to be a little bit um, forgiving of others when they make mistakes and use maybe vocabulary that isn't quite right. I'm going to actually skip to Francie's last slide. This is a graphic, um, maybe I can zoom in a little bit. Uh, this is a graphic that Heidi Reitmeyer um, with the city developed and it's similar to a lot of others that you've seen and the the purpose of this graphic is to show the difference between equality and equity. And here in this side, we see these three children trying to see over the fence and they have been given equal props. Everyone has a little box with three slats on it. Everyone is given this same exact thing. 
but it's not helping everyone. This child over here still can't see over the fence. On this side, we see an equitable solution. We give everyone what they need in order to be able to see over the fence. And these two terms, equality and equity, will be used interchangeably amongst the population, but you can't um, fault someone for using the wrong term. The real important thing here is this side of the slide, the equitable slide. We wanna make sure that we are giving access to everyone in a way that will make them um, feel welcome, will give them the opportunity to participate. And one interesting thing about this side of the slide that I wanna point out, when we were first um, reviewing this slide, um, you'll notice that um, this girl here, she looks like she's got a Muslim head covering. And then the girl here on the far right, she, um, she's black and she's given the most support. And I, I said, you know, is this really the message we want to portray is that, you know, we've got a black person over here. And our assistant city, city manager, Sandy Cedar said, absolutely, we've got to get this out there and stop trying to hide, you know, what the data is showing us. And, you know, and often, often cases, this is the real scenario is that our, our black population needs a little more help. So um, anyway, I want to then go back to a couple things that Francie talked about. And um, she has an example here of a monolingual Spanish speaker who might want to participate um, in a meeting, maybe a neighborhood meeting. And we need to think ahead of time what we can do to respond if that situation should arise. And one tool that the city has available for that situation is Language Line. It's a phone number that we can call and we can get a translator, even uh, sign language translation for just about any language at all. So um, you might want to, as a board, have something prepared in Spanish that says, you know, welcome. We want to make sure that you can participate and we have this resource available. It's called Language Line. Would you like to use it? Um, so that might be one thing that you can do to part uh, encourage participation. Um, Francie also mentioned with this is that if you've got a Spanish speaking member on the board, on your commission, you should not expect them to be a translator. Um, you know, if they want to volunteer, that's fine, but their job really is to participate in the meeting from a commissioner's standpoint and not be focused on translation. Um, so I think that's really good advice. Have something in mind ahead of time, have a plan, have maybe something printed up. Um, some things that you can do when you've got a monolingual Spanish speaker um, in attendance is that you are, you need to acknowledge them. Don't, because you don't speak their language, don't avoid them. I mean, whether they speak English or not, they, they will appreciate eye contact and, and some welcoming gestures. Um, and then obviously you need to give the resident the opportunity to speak either through language line or, you know, maybe another member of the public wants to volunteer. So we wanna give those people the opportunity to speak. Um, let me go on to the next slide here. And um, Francie's second example here was what to do if you have an offensive comment. And hopefully this will happen less and less as, as you know, the world becomes more educated, but um, I think it still does happen. And in fact, um, a couple months ago, there was a very offensive comment that was said at one of our um, council meetings one night. And, 
and no one really knew how to react quickly and how to say, hey, wait a minute, you know, let's talk about what was just said and see if we can find a different way to express that thought. Um, anyway, um, Francie has a really neat approach. It's not her approach. It was de developed by Dr. Keldy or something like that. Um, it's called the VCR approach. It's validate, challenge, and request. And I actually put together a separate handout on this because I think going through some exercises um, are helpful. And I'm going to pop over to the file that I created. And I, I don't know, who, I didn't know who was going to be in attendance tonight. And I don't know um, if some of these examples might offend anyone. But again, this is equity. And it's just the nature of, of the beast. Um, so validate challenge and request is an approach to handling offensive comments. And Angela, am I taking up too much time? Tell me if you need me to. Nope, you're just fine. Okay, so um, this has changed my font a little and changed my formatting, I'm sorry, but validate. It is important to validate something in every person without agreeing with them. So if someone says something offensive or with frustration or anger, the first thing that you need to do is validate. And some statements that could be used are, I can understand how you might feel that way about blank. You are not alone. Many people share your views. Or your opinion on this can actually help us understand this issue better. So empathize, you know, validate that their opinion, um, you know, Everyone's entitled to their own opinion. The second step is challenge. And you really only want to move to the second step once your validation has calmed things down a little bit. Lower the temperature, let that person, you know, feel recognized, and then go into the challenge. And the challenge is challenge the person to agree that issues and opinions can have two sides. So some examples of what you might say are, can you put yourself on the other side of this issue for a minute and let me ask you a few questions. So have them, have them step into the shoes of someone on the other side and just, um, you know, see if they can answer some questions about the issue. And I've got some examples down below that we might try if we have time. Um, or you might say to them, play devil's advocate here for a minute. If I were to say to you blank, how would you respond? Or how about, can you give me one good argument for the other side? You know, you're trying to get people to go to the other side from where they're standing, either put themselves in someone else's shoes or um, react to your opinion. The last thing I have here is if I were to say to you that my opinion on this matter is, you know, something different than yours, how would you react? So they need to realize that there are two sides to many issues. And then the last step is request. And that is request that the other presents a reasonable way of responding to the challenge. For example, could you please restate your opinion without using insulting language? Would it be possible for you to deliver your request again in a few minutes without using words that will insult or hurt anyone? Or could you please apologize to the others here and admit that there is probably a better way to phrase your opinion? It's, it takes guts to do this, um, especially in person. Um, we had a scenario recently in the office where someone included a, a cartoon in an email that um, showed um, it was a, a Nazi-based cartoon. And Sandy Cedar wrote right back and she said, you know, this is not a good example. This is not okay anymore. And um, please apologize to the rest of the people in the group. And, and she took the post down. 
Um, so anyway, I have some examples here of things that I thought since I was a commissioner at one time, these are things that, you know, I heard similar things to these and you could um, role play these maybe in a future meeting. Um, I'm just going to read the scenarios and we don't need to role play them now because I don't think we have time. But um, let's say a fellow commissioner says something like, those people don't appreciate the art the way others in this city do. I think we should look at locations in other neighborhoods. All right. That's, you know, those people. That is not acceptable to say that. Another example would be at a neighborhood meeting. What if someone were to say, this is a mostly white neighborhood. I don't think we want a statue of a black man here. Don't let that go unrecognized. You need to halt the conversation and, you know, challenge yourself to go through the VCR steps to, to address that and make the other people in the group realize too that what was said was not okay and that, you know, people should be mindful of what they say before they speak. Um, and this was one that was very, um, this might not be exactly word for word, something I heard at a shock art maquette. Um, I don't know if we're still doing that, but um, we used to have those, the boxes, the sample boxes made up and then set out for the public to look at. And I did witness someone say something like, this city always chooses too many ethnic themed boxes. Can't we just eliminate people from the boxes and have animals, nature, or abstract art? Um, and, you know, it might be an opportunity to, you know, step in and say, you know, I appreciate your opinion and I'd really like to, to learn more about your opinion. And, you know, just, um, Kind of spread the word that equity is on our minds. So that was what I wanted to share there. And then um, Holly, I think she's part of this board. I watched the new board uh, meeting. It was recorded and I watched it and, and she spoke up at the end. And one of her questions was, you know, how can we encourage more equitable boards? How can we get more diversity on our boards. And there is a tool that, um, let me see here, that USDN, the Urban Sustainability Directors Network in conjunction with GARE, we use that acronym a lot, Government Alliance on Race and Equity. They have this tool and I sent it to Angela today. And it's kind of a checklist to make sure that you are looking at projects and um, programs through an equi equity lens. And I don't think this checklist as it is, is, you know, would be good for AIPP, but I think you can use it as a starting point to make your own checklist. And one of these that I think is really important is step three. How have communities been engaged? Are there opportunities to expand engagement? So you might come up with your own questions to ask yourselves, have we really been reaching out to all different communities? And it doesn't mean, you know, demographic neighborhoods necessarily. A community can be the community of seniors in our city, the community of Latinx, um, Hispanic people in our community. Um, you know, we might say, we might think, you know, okay, um, through our online survey, we are giving everyone in the city, anyone in the city can go online and tell, take the survey and let us know how they feel. And we have a Spanish version and we might think, oh, okay, everyone has the chance to participate, but not everyone 
has a computer. Not everyone has internet access. And so you have to think beyond, you know, what's easy and say, how can we really um, encourage others to participate? Sure, this is online, but um, maybe we should go to the youth center and put up a suggestion box or the senior center or where are places where others in the community tend to gather where they might have the opportunity to give their input. Um, so I think, you know, you could probably build a checklist off of this step three. Um, and it sounds like you have already talked about advancing racial equity in your group, which is wonderful. But um, this checklist, which I sent to Angela, is a good place for you to start, I think, if you haven't already done so, um, in embedding. I don't know if that's quite the right word, but um, I'll use it for now for embedding an equity lens in what Art in Public Places does. I think that that's actually a really great segue because of the uh, sunset on Art in Public Places uh, strategic plan, which was Vision 2020, and the work that is underway with a citywide uh, you know, um, creative culture plan in, in tandem with the Art in Public Places strategic plan, and, and seeing how Art in Public Places can very much be a leader uh, on behalf of this. So thank you, Julie, and I will be sure to share this information of uh, certainly this document with everyone. And really, uh, I would just wanted to say that- the beginning, yeah, yeah. any comments? No, I, I, know, I would love to hear feedback from people. So I love this. Um, most of you know that equity, inclusiveness and community have been like one of my lifelong missions. It's something that I've been dedicated to from since I was a little kid. And I love that graphic of the equal and equitable. So Julie, I just, I, I found it and I will send it to you. Another one is if you, what if you just knock that fence down, completely down? Um, and that's one that I've, I've, I've used in, in the seminars that I've worked with, getting rid of all those fences so everyone can be a part. And what you said was so valuable in understanding that not everybody has internet, not everybody has, um, you know, when everything's written in English, people don't understand that. And going to the sources, like going to El Comente, going to um, our sources where we have folks, if you're saying that 25% of our community is Latinx, then we need to have 25% of our commissioners, at, at least shoot for them to be 25% of our group to be Latinx. Yep. And that's something that, um, this is great. So I can't even thank you enough for coming. I'm just so grateful. Sure. Anybody else um, just, have for Julie? I'm sorry, what? I was gonna say, does anybody else have some feedback or questions for Julie? Uh, yeah, I, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I just want to reiterate how important it is to, in that moment when someone says something uh, divisive or untrue or just racist or whatever, it is important to call them out on that immediately. Um, you can do it gently if you prefer. And, um, but slash and if you are interested in um, engaging that person in a more productive conversation and potentially disabusing them of their um, untrue or uh, destructive thought patterns, you can look up street epistemology. It's a way of like um, getting people to understand their own internal logic. And it's the first step in changing someone's mind or someone's opinion in those kind of uh, areas. Can you say that again? Because it's not something I've heard. Street? Uh, street epistemology is, um, if I remember right, huh. the study of belief and how we create and follow our own beliefs. Interesting. Okay, it's street epistemology. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank we'll you. take notes, Julie, and send them to you. I would also encourage you all to read How to Be an Anti-Racist. Um, it's, it's very, very powerful. Um, I used to think White Fragility was the, the book of all trades, but How to Be an Anti-Racist is amazing. So if that's something, put it on your reading list. I promise you won't be able to put it down. I can see a couple of hands up, starting with Marsha Martin and then followed by Jennifer Miller. Julie, would you mind like, yeah, thank you.
Who would like to speak? I couldn't unmute myself. Sometimes my space bar doesn't do it, sorry. Um, I am thinking about the application process for boards and commissions. And I, you know, my first thought was, well, we should put on the application if you're gonna need any special facilitation in order to be able to ask, to interact with the board. And then I thought, well, but wait a minute, that might bias selection. So maybe the process should be more like before the first board first convenes, we would ask each elected member um, whether they needed any, any such accommodations. Randy, how, how would you address that particular concern? I think that's for Julie. Oh, I'm oh, yeah. sorry, Julie. Oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> and I was ready to talk. Um, that question is for me. I Yes. Hmm. Um, I was thinking about this today when I was putting together that checklist um, after what Holly said at the, um, the meeting that was recorded that I saw, you know, she wanted to encourage more diversity amongst the boards. And I think a big barrier is fear right now. Um, if you've never been on a board, if you are, you know, let's say your first language isn't English, you probably would feel very intimidated by being on a city commission. Um, and you know, I don't know how that could be made less intimidating, more welcoming. You know, it would be really cool. I was thinking, man, if I had a neighbor or a friend um, who, whose first language wasn't English, who was interested in our community and our arts, just to invite them to come as a guest to one of the meetings and just listen and, and you know, see how, see how it all works. Um, I know this board, this commission is a real kind of a casual, really friendly group of people. And um, I did have the opportunity to sit in on another board and boy, was it stiff and formal and I was intimidated. Um, you know, it was like you had to, um, ask permission to speak and whatnot, but I think we need to um, try and make being a board member less intimidating somehow, and I'm not sure how to do that. And I don't know if maybe someone else has some ideas, but I just think it's intimidating to people, especially if English is not your first language. Well, I don't want to interrupt, but I do think that this is something that we need to continue, continue to chew on. We do have quite a bit of an agenda to move through today, but I think that taking this with you, I will certainly forward along a lot of this information and recognize that we have a number of seats that will be opening up for June. So it's March. We have time to talk about it. We, um, as an active part of our board, to continue to bring this conversation to the table and spend a little bit of time with this uh, and, and charge on Amy's six year agenda of <laughs> making this an active part of our conversation. And that uh, again, we're, we're continuing what the city is already doing. So um, if anybody has any other questions just quickly for Julie, uh, we need to, we'll get moving along with the rest of our agenda. So, and of course, thank you, Julie. Thank you, thank you, thank on, you. I can send it along. Yeah, if you want to pass on, if you all would like to continue this discussion, um, I'm I'm sure Angela and I are welcome to like like you have an email discussion and and then forward some of our information to Julie. Things that I know this sparks. I mean, we could have a like I mean, we could like be here seven hours and talk about this stuff because I've been there. Like we have a ten minute meeting and then we're there six hours later. So let's let's not say that this is the end of the discussion, but the beginning. Okay. I think it's really important that we say, you know what, we've got to do this. And this is beautiful. And it, I'm so excited the city is looking at things that way. So Julie, gosh, thank you so much. You're Thanks, welcome. Julie.
Awesome. Bye-bye. Have a good rest of your evening, everyone. You too. Take care. Thanks for being Thank here. Thank you. Great, great, great stuff, everyone. Thank you for participating in that. I know it can be a challenging um, discussion. So we're ready to move on. Um, we talked about new commissioner feedback. Um, so here's a, if you're on your budget or on your budget, <laughs> thinking about budget too. If you're on your agenda, the number seven is commission executive committee seats. Um, we're gonna have a few spots available and um, I want you to, we need to start thinking about who wants to, getting, of course, as we talked about earlier, getting new members, um, but also looking at, you know, those of you who are, who ter terms are expiring. Um, if you don't know that, you can let us know and we will be happy to tell you um, if your, your term is up, but I think you are. And then also starting to look at leadership positions. Um, and we want to have a nominating task force. Um, this would be two people. And this would be a pair that will help Angela by meeting with current executive committee members, engage the interest in remaining in their roles. So we would be wanting to, these two people would be talking to everyone on the commission and Angela will catch me if she can, um, talking to people about what, they're, what they want to do on our commission, um, looking at you know who would like to assume some leadership positions or be considered on that. So this would be the nominating committee and then that will move forward into an executive committee type situation, correct, Angela? Yep, so we're just looking for a couple of folks who are interested in being on a couple of emails. We'll reach out to every single commissioner, ask, engage your interest, get a little bit of feedback about um, what you're excited about. And then uh, again, trying to fill some of the leadership roles prior to our, um, uh, recruiting for new commissioners. And then I will also reach out to each of you who have a uh, term limitation and also who are up for reapplication and encourage you and help you if you're interested in going through that process. So we'll have five seats, of course. Um, and then uh, following that will be the task force, kind of revisiting all of our task forces the different subcommittees that you're on and uh, get engage interest that way. So um, hopefully post vaccine COVID. So we'll get a little more active. Yeah, we talked about that today. That's getting closer every day. It's getting closer every day. You know, I'm term limited. Um, my term is up in germ, germ. In speaking of germs in June. And um, so I'm sad to leave, but I'm also very happy to see so many positive things happening with the commission. So really search your soul and, and think about what direction you want to go in. Um, this is a, I will say probably we're at a really huge turning point on this commission. I think the city is too. So there's a lot of room for growth and development and expansion and y'all are such bright creative people. Think about what you would like to do. So do we have someone who would be like a couple folks? We can only have two. <laughs> Um, that would like to step forward. Okay, Laurel, Susan, you would like to like form that? Okay, great. Anybody else? Um, we can't have more than two, so we can have a battle of the bands if you would like. Okay, so this would mean that Laurel and Susan, you would like reach out to all of the current members, except for those of us who are term limited, which is me. Um, we don't, um, our other term limited pe person is Francis. Um, we're not sure what her plans are, but at this point, we think that she's um, not going to join us for future endeavors. So um, those are the, you, you'll reach out to everybody on our list and see what they would like. Is that too much? Or is it, yeah, Laura, you're muted, my friend. Susan, did you have some feedback? Um, I was looking for clarification about what it was exactly, but then you restated it. So all good. Okay, I'm the queen of restate, so that's good. Um, I have to ask my um, Angela, my Angela, um, do we need to vote on that or do we just need volunteers? Oh, it's just a task force. So if everybody's good with a, a, a Laurel and Susan being the nominating uh, task force, they'll reach out again. It'll be a group email to each of you individually asking and Laurel and I will come up with a series of of questions, but in the meantime, if you can just think about your interests, think about 
the post-vaccine COVID when we open back up uh, your interest uh, and, and leadership roles the way that you would like to engage. And again, if being a part of uh, that executive committee is something that you're interested in, our nominations happen in April. So we do have uh, you know, a month to think about if that really is a role that you're interested in or what questions you have. So we'll connect. It's awesome. I will not be here in April. My son's getting married. So I was, we're, we're going to kindly ask for um, our co-chair, our amazing co-chair Randy to maybe step in and, and um, take that over for the month and just, um, you don't need to do much. Angela is like, she's just amazing. So you just, you guys will be working together on that. So it's good. This is a great opportunity for folks. And um, I'm going to kind of sideline this really quickly. We would love to have a coach, a co-chair who really might want to someday be chair. Um, it's really, really fun stuff. Right, Randy? Aren't you excited? Yeah. Look at her. Yep. Okay, Amy. All right. We are recording this. And so we'll move forward um, to our conservative and maintenance area. Um, Oh, sorry, sorry, I almost skipped shock art. How could I do that? Um, so this is really fun stuff. Um, you gotta go back. We're at number eight. Oh, gosh, I skipped myself and Holly. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, folks. So um, Holly and I have been partaking in a strategic plan um, like subcommittee with Angela talking about some of the things that we're gonna need to put forward. I missed last week, but I was informed this week that we've got some really exciting news. And so I'll let Angela and Holly share that with you. It's pretty cool. Go for it, Angela, start us off. Oh man, I'm trying to talk less in my life. Um, so Holly, myself and, and Amy have been working diligently on assessment of all of the plans that exist within the city and primarily the one that holds up city planning under uh, the wonderful guidance of Erin Fosdick. Uh, she's a principal planner for the city. It is called Envision. And uh, if you'll recall in, in February of, of 2020, Erin Fosdick came and met with all of us to introduce, if you hadn't already known about the, the pillars of Envision Longmont. And so we've been doing quite a deep dive into uh, arts and culture, creative culture, and how that is uh, how that is prioritized, how that has been addressed, and, and how uh, our community has has demonstrated and articulated what that they what they uh, value for creative culture within the city. So we've been meeting, I've been meeting with a lot of city staff people and just mining the heck out of every bit of feedback that we've received with the goal of course to to enter into not only the new um, strategic planning venture that needs to happen and is due for art and public places but also while we are doing this work understanding how we can continue to support and inform Envision Longmont from that creative culture uh, perspective and for a larger cultural plan. So uh, luckily just the, and again, I've met with everyone. So I've met with sustainability, I've met with LDDA and, uh, and, and we're looking around the table who needs to be at the table when we're talking about this. So um, just this last week, we've received quite a bit of the information from Envision Longmont. I met with Aaron Fosdick and the next step is going to be uh, really an assessment of our group here and then looking at how, how we continue to branch out. So within the next couple of months, you can absolutely anticipate um, that in interaction and that engagement, that feedback opportunity. It's unfortunate that we're, we're still in the era of, of virtual and finding the ways to, to engage virtually, but uh, we're getting there. So um, that's the Big stuff from my perspective, Holly, do you have anything to yeah, add? I, I would just add that as a commission, it may seem like we've been working on this for a couple of months already. 
and that we've not made big progress that we've been able to bring forward to this group. But I would just say that behind the scenes, specifically Angela has been knocking on the doors of the right people that are our stakeholders that we need to pull together really to make some traction with what it is we're doing. Um, and I would also add that even with our visit today from Julie Stone, I think that's a big step towards working through our strategic plan because we recognize that diversity, the inclusion piece is really important for our commission. And so please take that today as an opportunity for us to start the, start the language, to start the communication. And Angela and I had mentioned this week that maybe what we wanna do is at the beginning or the end of a future commissioner meeting, we may just wanna take some time just to do some brainstorming about how we as a commission, outside of what the city's even working on can help to become more inclusive and to look at a more diverse group. So more to come and just know that there's a lot Amy and Angela are doing behind the scenes that you guys just aren't seeing right now. I'm really excited to go through that, the material. I'm like, I told Angela, that sounds so much fun to me. I mean, everybody's like, what? But I, I want to know what our community wants and or what the, what the expectation is. And I had a really like huge blindside event this week working with, um, in the same area. And one of the folks said, I don't like the word inclusion. And I was like, what? I just got done saying that diversity wasn't the word we should be using. Um, but this person who's an expert in the area said, I like to think about with inclusion, you're up here and you're kind of saying, I'm going to include you. But with diver but with community, we're all one big community. We're Everybody is in this community. We're not trying to pull somebody up into where we're at. Um, we recognize that these folks are already in our community. Their voices just haven't been heard. So that's just a, an interesting insight. Um, as I think Julie pointed out, we're all learning. Y'all, we have to offer each other grace and we have to say, you know what? We're gonna screw up. We're gonna make mistakes. We're gonna say wrong words. I do it every day. So um, this is exciting work and I hope that you all progress and. Um, I, I can tell you're really open to it. So that's exciting. Anything else, Angela or Holly? You guys are amazing. You folks are amazing. I did it. See, I just did it. I called y'all guys. We're not, yeah, not all of us are guys. Um, we're folks. Y'all, Texans came in here. Any other thing you want to add in that? Okay, excellent. I keep muting myself and then number nine, number nine, number nine. Okay, there we go. Just oh my gosh. But see, then I somehow I got blocked out of there. Number nine, public art project updates. Well, then we can just let our friend Angela tell us about our public art updates. So uh, you'll find hopefully within embedded fancily and technologically, that's not a word, um, a link. You'll find a link in the Art on the Move. So we had talked about the training video for the jury and I found it's 30 minutes and it's absolutely worthwhile. And my hope is that for the cafe, which that's callforentry.org, uh, that this will be a, a lovely introduction and answer all the questions about how you'll go about doing the jury process for Art on the Move. Uh, take a peek at it. Please spend some time, carve out that time um, keep a notebook handy for all of the things that it doesn't answer. And maybe um, I will nudge you halfway, maybe in a couple of weeks and to maybe let's say two weeks and anything that it doesn't answer, how confused are you? We'll just do that, that one-on-one -on -one, um, question and answer. And I can screen share and, and show you through. But again, I spent quite a bit of time with callforentry.org and I do think that this is a, is a pretty good video. So uh, I'll resend the link just in case you're not able to access it through this agenda. Uh, but I think it's a good tool. It's a great tool. So uh, that's really the bit about that. And then I guess questions, it's not really much to ask about that. Oh yeah, Randy. It's okay. <laughs> I'm 
I'm embarrassed to ask, but when does the call go out for Art on the Move? Oh, any minute now. Um, I ran into a snafu. I actually loaded it as artist face and it was supposed to be artwork based. Uh, so they had to take it down and redo it. Okay. And do you know what platform it's going to go out on? Callforentry.org. It's also called Cafe. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And I, I'm we sure are more familiar with everybody cafe, should see a Facebook post if you follow us on Facebook. Sorry, Amy, go ahead. And if you're not following us on Facebook, your only excuse is that you're not on Facebook. I am following on Facebook. Excellent. And that's okay, Noah. Do we have an Instagram? Do we have Snapchat? Do we have all that too? Um, at the present moment, there is, and I, I might do a misstep on this, but um, social media in general is is fairly restrictive. And so the city has an Instagram account. Um, and uh, like uh, ourselves, the museum, others don't really have, we have, we're allowed to have Facebook accounts and not Instagram. We've been, we've been through this one before, Angela, it's okay. And that will come around as we like, initially we had a hard time even getting Facebook. So this is, this is really exciting. The other thing, but I'm gonna tell you what my students would say like, Facebook is for old people. And I hate that <laughs> term. I mean, I'm sorry that that's there, there there's another bad word. Um, but Facebook is not um, bringing in the folks that the, you know, multi-generational group. So just a thought, I, I love my Facebook and um, that's the way it is. Anything else on that, Angela? Okay, this is another really exciting thing because it's kind of addressing the whole guess what? We're going to get to come out of our houses again. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to move on to our um, shock art committee. Um, we're going to talk about um, maybe some in-person in -person voting. Angela? So the shock art committee is presently going through and looking at the um, options. We still are, uh, there's still available options. So if the committee sees something else, but uh, here by the end of the month, we'll hopefully lock those down and the committee will have uh, visited. So I know that they're working on it. But the other piece of that was that we uh, were reaching out to Old Town Marketplace. And so I spoke to Old Town Marketplace, looked at the timeline, backed it out from when I need to have artists under contract and giving artists ample time to complete the project. And also spoke to Old Town Marketplace about their comfort level of when and how an in-person situation could occur. And so we have agreed, and again, this is completely open dialogue, uh, that an open setup for all maquettes being June 19th of in-person voting for three weeks, which would culminate on July 10th. That is the second Saturday which also from a marketing standpoint, we can dovetail in with what LDDA and the creative district are doing with their existing marketing. So that's wonderful because we will get two different times. Uh, once when it will open and say, come down and visit, you'll see these things on display on the June second Saturday. And then also another op marketing opportunity for it's your last chance to vote on the second Saturday in July. This being said, we are inviting people to come and exist and uh, be in an in-person event. Certainly we are the city and we, we will make sure that there are socially distant and um, all protocols in the way of clean pens and pencils and all of that business. But we are leaning very heavily on Old Town Marketplace to be able to, and they say they can, um, monitor this. Uh, and, and see that it is underway, as well as how the ballots are filled out with name, email address, um, address, and we'll use those, those email addresses then to filter with our online experience to make sure that there's not ballot stuffing happening. So the question really here for, for the commission is uh, if you feel comfortable having in-person voting, that the situation sounds like something that you're comfortable promoting uh, as a as a body of the city, I will need a couple of volunteers 
if you feel comfortable in some setting up, some breaking down, and some socially distant voting ballot counting. Um, so really discussion for you and decision for you. Is there an option, Angela, for, and I know this is probably way more work, but to do an online, which is kind of a virtual version of the voting like we've done in the past and doing an, a, a live version? Yes, 100%. I think it will be either 100% online the way that we pivoted and knocked it out last year. I thought it was quite successful uh, because we were able to go through and, and eliminate any duplicate votes. And then the only requirement will be that anyone who votes in person will have to write a legible email address and we will then cross pollinate sort within the smart sheet, be able to take out any duplicates and then recognize that they're individual votes. Of course, there could be error, but I think that it's a pretty solid situation. So it's pretty much all online voting or online hybrid in-person voting. Those are the two options. Do you Any need other feedback, Andrea? She was there and now she's gone. Huh, okay. Anybody else? Maybe Andrea will rejoin us. Any other feedback on that? What do y'all think? You think that both options are a good thing? I think yeah. that the fact that we can you know, yes. go ahead, Randy. We go definitely on. need to keep it open, both both versions of voting in person and online. Yeah, I agree. Um, and then Angela, you, uh, I responded to you as part of the task force for shock art. Um, did you want me to actually pick boxes that I felt were, I mean, I gave you my opinion on certain boxes, which means I kind of don't have a preference. Anything is fine, but you're good with my response. Yeah. So, so G, the, um, LPC gave us that list, uh, but also said that in the past, really the community uh, going out and finding boxes that they would suggest um, as options was completely possible. That's not to say it will be a, I always get it, I mess it up, pad, pad switch, pad switch box. Right. An applicable box. Right. But needless to say, if you see one, it's in disrepair and could be a possibility, just send it to me and I'll send it to Kevin and he'll let me know if it's a thumbs up or a thumbs down. In the past, um, I had suggested a box that was right. Somebody could see it from their backyard. It wasn't on their property. I mean, it was pretty far away, but they could still see it from their backyard. Are we discouraging stuff like that or anything goes? I mean, I think that when we think about the program and because it's art in public places, highly visible for all of the public, but that's just my opinion. I think the concern was that that homeowner would not be happy seeing the box, but I don't know. Does anybody else have thoughts about that? I can certainly ask Kevin if he has had experience in the past with that. Yeah, I would ask and see what he says. Are you saying that the homeowner was the only person that could see the box? No, 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 no. It was on a sidewalk, a major sidewalk in thorough, not a major thoroughfare, but the neighborhood, one of the main streets. Was the homeowner offended by the box? It hasn't been painted because we didn't choose it, but I, it's quite visible and it would have been a nice location. It's just, they look, their backyard looks right onto it. <laughs> I know. You bought the house, such is life. Oh, Laurel. <laughs> Laurel, unmute yourself, friend. Laurel, you need to unmute yourself. Oh, Laurel unmutes. I'm going to say Andrea's battery died and she said to sign her up for Shocker. And Joanne, okay. you can see. Oh, there she is. 
Okay. <laughs> it seems like it might be a great opportunity uh, to invite this homeowner to be a part of the, uh, the committee that chooses the art for the lockbox, uh, shock boxes. Uh, and, and to be, you know, kind of inclusive in that way or reaching out into the community. Yeah, I actually thought about knocking on their door at one point and just asking their opinion. Yeah. I never did. I haven't. I still can, but I'd like to hear first what Angela gets from Kevin. Kevin is his name? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. let me ask <laughs> Kevin first, just because I, I'm always wary of um, uh saying or inviting one citizen to participate yeah. and then not being able to be uh, available for all people. But at the same time, um, anytime that there's a box outside on, on anyone's uh, property near or egress, we invite them to suggest it. So it's, let me see what Kevin says, um, but I think that's great. Um, well, the, the problem there is of course, you can invite that person, but it's by, public vote and if the public votes for something that they hate then then they're stuck with it yeah okay other feedback well, we do think uh, it's probably prudent to take a vote of if we should have in person or not i mean it's it's a yeah, little yeah we talked about that we will but sometimes what happens when i say let's call it to a vote then somebody's like no, 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 I have one more question. So let's clear the air here, folks. Does anybody have any more discussion? Because this is a pretty big one. Any other discussion? Okay, what are so, we discussing? <laughs> so um, Andrea, we're, we're gonna have a motion. Somebody will be posing a motion. If we should go ahead and have both um, in-person voting and online voting. There will not be one or the other unless you say we don't want any in person. Is that correct, okay. Angela? So if you think nope, no in person, but that time frame, folks, is pretty. You know, it's to June nineteenth to July tenth, and they're estimating that close to seventy percent who want to be vaccinated will be vaccinated by that time. If you want to be, not that you don't have to be. Yes, Peter. Well, it's that's far enough out that committing ourselves to one procedure or another right now seems a little premature. Actually, no, because we've got to get that space reserved, Peter. We've got to like, I mean, believe it or not, you think about how fast time well, we, 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 can, we can reserve the space, but to just say right now that there will be yeah. no in-person voting or there will be in-person voting is probably a little early because recommendations are going to change based on conditions between now. I mean, if there's a sudden surge in, in cases in late May. That Angela, what do you, I mean, I think that we do still need to have the availability. If there were conditions that like said, if Governor Polo said, absolutely, you know, we're down to, a, we're up to a red level and nobody can do it. Of course we wouldn't do that. But to have that absolutely. option to have both, right? Angela, is that what we're kind of looking at? Yes, I, I would say that of course, you know, this commission is beheld to all of the advice of the city manager and he is very thoughtful about these spaces. Uh, and I think that we could commit to Old Town Marketplace with the caveat that if at any time we don't feel comfortable that we can pull it. That being said, I would like to tell artists who we're gonna encourage to start painting their boxes that we are doing everything that we can to have an in-person vote or not. Um, Noah? they will ask. So yeah, they will. Noah, did you have feedback? And then Cindy? Yeah, I'm confused as to why this is something we need to vote on, assuming we use the contingency that we do both in person and online, and then something happened and, and cases spike and and you know we got locked back down or whatever, we would still have the vote, everything would continue to go as scheduled. So I'm I'm confused as to why this is even an option or a question. Um, my feeling is that because of the, you know, there's some concerted effort to to get back into the into the I don't want to say real world, um, that we just want to have that vote standing. Um, you know, if there are some folks that say absolutely no in person, then we want to have those voices heard. I think that's what we're looking at. Um, of course, it, like like Angela just said, and you're completely right, Noah, it's a contingency. If we 
if the say if the world says absolutely not and i think it'll also be a choice if you feel safe and comfortable going and voting in person that's your choice um mm-hmm. and if the state or if you know things do change but it's kind of good to have it in the record that you know we have both options i think that's what we're trying to do yes angela yes and also i can't do it myself i'm right. going to need so we need people to help us that was one mm. of the other things. We need a couple of people to help us get this going. So Andrea, Randy, and well, let's go Cindy first. Cindy. Um, I, I'm a little bit confused. Are we saying that if we have no in-person voting, we won't put the maquettes in the old town marketplace and we won't even have the, well, they have to paint them because we have to put them up online if we did it that way. But I don't understand why we couldn't put the maquettes up in Old Town Marketplace, and then we can decide the night, well, the week before if we have in-person voting. Otherwise, we can just put up a big sign that says, please vote online. We need people to help with that. That's what we're kind of looking at. You know, we need to have people say, I'm going to go to town. We need, Angela needs help from us saying, we're going to go put those those up. Um, okay, I saw hands. Danielle and then um, Andrea. Okay, all right, Andrea? I was just going to say that I'm so excited and I think we should try to do both. Understanding and everybody will understand that we might not, we might have to cancel on the in-person and please sign me up to volunteer to help on one of the nights. Excellent. Noah? Yeah, same, I would, I would like to volunteer as well. And um, if everyone uh, is ready, I'll make the motion that we um, We've got a couple more I, discussions, and then, then yeah, okay. Okay. then we'll have you make that motion. Great, thank you, Noah and Andrea. Uh, Danielle. Um, actually, I was just gonna say the same thing. <clears throat> just volunteering. So, um, but I think we definitely. I am like we definitely. No, just looking at how the public is already handling this, it's definitely like something that we should really consider. Just on the fact that like anybody in every company around is looking forward to having activities out of the house. So, I know just I am looking in the public. <laughs> um, Cindy, are we talking about? Are we talking about having coverage the whole time the marketplace is open every day for three weeks? No, we're looking at folks that would help set it up um, and then maybe go in and monitor those boxes, make sure that they're filled up, make sure that we can go in. We, we're gonna need to make sure that they're not, as, as you said, uh, ballot stuffed. <laughs> you know, people aren't like, yeah. So we'll just need someone to, a couple folks to monitor that and go in, is that correct, Angela? And it will probably be someone helping me set up, someone meeting the rental company for the tables, uh, someone, you know, and I'll set up volunteer shifts for folks to go over and collect the ballots so the box isn't too full, uh, a number of people to sit down with me and to go through the ballots. Uh, there'll just be a, 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 an array of volunteer shifts. And again, the bigger thing is just when artists are asking how the voting is going to happen, that I can say confidently that we're going to do everything we can to have an in-person event, barring any, you know, uh, authority who says that we can't, uh, but, but that if I have enough folks who are willing to volunteer for a variety of very social distant and safe activities of volunteering, um, that I'll we- vo- I'd volunteer too. Okay, so Angela, what I think might be best is if we put together a spreadsheet of sorts, so we don't have everybody. I mean, we know we got a lot of people that I just saw a whole bunch of excitement, which excited me. Yeah. Um, so I think if Angela would send out a call for us volunteers to come in, and then maybe she can send some slots that we can sign up for. Um, I'm happy to help you with that, Angela. Andrea? Are we having it during an art walk night, or is that a little too crowded? Yep, it'll be the second Saturday. So uh, we'll promote it during the June 2nd Saturday of the three weeks that they'll be on display. And then uh, it's uh, second Saturday, which is July 10th. Art Walk in May is not happening um, via the folks, but uh, Art Walk in September is, but that's too late for this program. So So July 10th would be the night that we might actually have, you need volunteers to kind of, 
make sure people aren't touching boxes and yeah, that night, we'll and, you know, we probably will have cleaning procedures. You know, I know that we finally started going back to campus for things. So um, I'm sure Angela and I will, 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 I won't be there. Holy cow. I'll be good. Um, but I'll, I'll come and play with y'all, but we, we will have cleaning supplies there and get things cleaned up. Yes, Laurel. You're muted, Laurel. Laurel, we can't hear you. Uh, how about that? Are, will we have a coffee bar again in the- uh... I, I don't think there will be any food or drinks, do you, Angela? I think that's really off right now. Okay. Very I, good. I'm not gonna say that for sure, but I know that the state is saying, yeah, you can meet again, but no food or drink, unless it's like a restaurant who's adhering to health guidelines. So I don't know. Uh, Let's get, that's a thing, a bridge we can cross when we get closer uh -huh. to see okay. you know, what our rates are. We're seeing a steady, steady decline, but we also have spring break. And I know my CU students are gonna be, they're all traveling. So we'll, let's just see what happens. <laughs> okay, we see Noah, this is why I said we needed to have more discussion because everybody has some feedback. Is there any more discussion before uh, we move on to a motion? Okay, calling once, calling twice. All right, we would like to have a motion um, for this event. Who would like to uh, give that motion, please? Noah, go uh, ahead. Yeah, I motion that um, concerning the 2021 shock art voting procedures that we do both um, online and in person to have the most uh, amount of contingency plans um, regarding the, the vote. So when might we include an addendum that um, permitting that, you know, everything per, that conditions permitting at the beginning of that, would you mind adding something maybe to that effect? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I'd start the whole sentence over. <laughs> um, what did I even say? Uh, I, I motion. <laughs> I motioned that, uh, yeah, considering the 2021 shock art voting process, that um, uh, taking into account uh, material conditions and the uh, health and public safety and welfare, um, all of those regulations that we hold our voting process both in person and online. Thank you very much, Noah. Do we have a second on that? Okay, Randy was first. And uh, Peter, we, we were done with our discussion. What's up? <laughs> Remember, I'd like what colleague wants. Well, I was just going to offer an amendment that, that we should, at this point, plan to make use of the um, Old Town Marketplace with the expectation that exactly what Noah said would be possible. I think that's a great combination. Thank you, Peter. Perfect. I, Noah, still, still, I second it still. All right. So Randy's second stands. Any um, other? Okay. Um, all in favor? Okay. Opposed? The motion passes. Good work, folks. Very good work. All right. Now we're on to some easier stuff. Conservative and maintenance. Um, so Angela's going to share about um, the color, colorful poetry um, in Middle Ages. Actually, we have a task force that's working on that. So I think Noah and Susan? No, Holly. Gosh, Holly, you're doing it. All right. Go ahead, please. So, hey, I'll just start by saying that the name of the piece is actually Colorful Poetry in the Middle Pages instead of Ages. So that's, yeah, and it makes more sense when you look at it that way. Um, and if you remember from the last meeting, we started a discussion about this piece that's located in the Civic Center and it's, um, banners that are actually a series of 40 banners that are hanging in the Civic Center that have been there for quite a few years. And there's been some question about the, um, the color as well as how the material has held up over all of these years. And so we created a task force last month and we did meet this month. And I actually, if we've got a few minutes, I have a PowerPoint that might help to explain a little bit about, more about the piece. Um, 
Are you okay, you okay with that, Angela? We're at 726. So we'd like to be conscious of time, but I think we're doing great on time. I'd love to see that. I think okay. everybody wants to see that, I bet. Thanks, Holly. It will be quite quick. And but I'm not Holly share. Yeah, you can share your screen. You're enabled. You see it already? Oh, wait, hang on. Hang on one second. I grabbed it. Okay. Okay, doesn't look like it's coming. How about now? I'm seeing it. Can you see it now? Okay, let me just got it. Get start from the beginning. Okay. So as I mentioned, the title is Colorful Poetry of the Middle Pages. Um, and a little bit about this piece is it was an initially initially commissioned in 1992 with a banner day when we hung it in 1994. And you can see there's some photos in this slide and they're actually photos that came from the original um, Times Call articles that were kind of put in place to make this an, an exciting opening. And interestingly enough, it was, it was mentioned in the Times Call that this piece was actually a piece that they reached back to the artist so that the artist could design something specific for that space. And it specifically said that they had hundreds of entries that were chosen from and they picked this piece. A little bit about the artist, her name is Louise Cotis. She's American born from 1942. And just in a quick review of her artist statement, um, which is right there on the slide, her statement, which she had developed quite a few years ago because she's obviously about 80 years old at this point in time. Um, her artist statement was unwrapping translucent floating colors. And one thing of interest to me when I visited her site where, the, where her pieces hung, I think that her statement from that point in time, um, way back when still holds true about the piece that's still hanging today. This is just a couple of slides that show the images of the piece as they are today. So um, mind you, there's a big difference in the ability to take photographs in uh, 1994 as opposed to 2021. And these pictures were just taken with my iPhone. And so you're gonna see a higher quality photo but you'll also notice that there's some fading that has gone on with the piece. Um, so one of the one of the kind of the things that the task force was tasked with was reviewing the, the contractual language in the original contract. And this is all a part of the uh, policy related to deaccession. And in review of the contract, some kind of things that jumped out were was that the city does have the right to determine after consultation with professional conservator when and if repairs or restoration of work um, can't be made any longer. Um, and also during the artist's lifetime, the city shall use every me reasonable means to consult with the artist before we do any restoration or repairs. So a little bit about the pieces that um, are hung there. Back when the contract came out, there was a kind of a uh, um, some verbiage in the contract that said that the artist needed to provide us with information about how we maintain her artwork. And interestingly enough, she said that we can remove the dust by beating both sides of the banner with a broom, kind of like if you put laundry or your rug outside, this is how you clean it. Um, another thing in the contract she wrote was that we could remove spots left by bugs with a clean washcloth. And ultimately, if the piece was just too dirty that we could throw it in a washing machine with woolite um, and then iron it with, a, with kind of a cool iron. <laughs> um, a little bit about the maintenance that has already happened on this piece. Back in July of 20, 2009, there was um, a really a refurbish that was completed by a textile conservator at the cost of what we can tell at this point was about $2,400. Um, I'll just mention though that there was kind of a two piece bid 
about the work that needed done. And it appears that that 2,400 only covered one section of the pieces that were pulled down. So Angela and I are still diligently trying to see if there has been some additional repair besides that conservator repair. Um, but lastly, the artist did in 2011 do some maintenance on her own where the pieces came down and she did some re what's titled repair and replacements at the cost of about $930. So, um, so our policy about the accession of artworks really has a couple of good reasons why we can deassess something. And one of them is that the artwork has undergone extensive maintenance and is no longer cost effective to continue to restore. Um, the artwork can also be deemed irreparable. Um, if the artwork happens to endanger public safety in any way, then it can be pulled down. Um, if a government improvement necessitates the deaccession, which might be an important piece in terms of um, this, this kind of a, this, this consideration. And lastly, if there's an emergency that necessitates it, necess, necess, necessitates it to be pulled down, then it can be. So if it had been damaged in the flood where the whole building was damaged, we could have pulled it down then as well. Um, so, a little bit more about the policy. We, we have formed a task force, which is what we're doing now. We reviewed the contract. Um, we may seek public and other professional input, which Angela is in the process of potentially reaching out to the textile conservator again. And then if we decide that we do want to come to the point where we want to vote, then the majority of the commission will um, indeed have a, a vote and the majority present will um, stand for that vote. So here's just a comparison of the slide on the left being from 1944, I'm, I'm sorry, 1994 when the piece was or originally hung. And then the picture that I took just last week. So, and I think we mentioned last week uh, or last month that the price for that piece um, when it was acquired was $15,000. And at this point, there's been about $2,500 repair that we're certainly aware of. Um, and one of the questions would be, what's the current value of the piece? So we could determine um, if it's worth doing more repair. So, so just lastly, um, one more slide here after this one, but the task force recommendations are that we talk with the textile conservator and evaluate the piece um, for additional insight of what may have additionally happened in 2009, um, that we potentially consider doing an appraisal and that would be done by the textile conservator as well, um, depending on what the cost might be for that. And the last consideration that we might wanna look at is actually gathering some community opinion or input about whether they think that the work um, needs to be refurbished further and if it will remain in its current position. Um, and one thing that we thought about was, you know, maybe a poster um, that we could have review and voting and potentially could be alongside shock art. Um, and we're open to hearing any other ideas about what other folks on the commission might say. Um, and it looks like Peter's raising his hand. I'm gonna leave this slide for last and Angela's gonna give us some insight as to why these three pictures are here. Peter, what, what were you want, wanting to ask? I was just gonna say, it's a little hard to make a judgment based upon your pictures because your recent photo looks more vivid than the old photo. Exactly, and I think that has to do with is faded in reverse, the colors right. are Right, <laughs> yeah. And that's my iPhone 12 technology related to that technology that was available back in the period of time where that first picture was taken. Yeah, it's not a convincing picture. I, I, had I chosen which I thought were was the oldest, I would have thought your photo was, was the newer one. Yeah. That, that, you yeah. can see that there's some more vivid colors though in the original from 1994. I think a lot of the reds from back then now have yeah. turned into pinks and purples. Yeah. Are there other people, comments? She's got her bonus slides, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay. 
Yep, that's for Angela to talk about. I have a question. Okay. I never saw the artwork when it was first put in, but I saw it a year ago and I didn't know the colors had faded. They look, they not, they're not white. They're not hanging in shreds. I don't know that the aging of a piece must necessarily make it bad. Does that make sense? It does. I mean, it's still, it's still pretty. I'm it's, all in favor of things getting better as they get older. Yeah, it's, it, <laughs> it's still pretty. It still seems to be in one piece from the few pictures I've seen. And from the time, what, a year ago, a year and a half ago, I was in there. Um, so I'm not 100% sure. May, we might want to move it, but I don't know that we necessarily need to deassess it. That's a good point. Exactly why we're uh, addressing this piece is, uh, and I, I should specify that the conversation of this piece came up because uh, of the folks that go every day, which is mostly st city staff, right? But the folks who go to pay their bills and, and receive information from the information desk necessarily aren't there every day. And so that's where that community feedback portion could be really valuable. They're not in shreds and they're not torn. Uh, yes, they've faded in time from documentation, but that doesn't, necess that doesn't necessarily, to your point, uh, make some work not um, successful in a space, right? Um, and so the reason that the bonus slide is up is just that uh, there has been, as you know, a quite a large CIP that came through and quite a large sum has contributed to uh, art in public places. I have gone through now a couple of trainings, understanding how I can go into our financial system to understand um, from the moment where a CIP um, and that again is a civic improvement project. And that's how, what the construction of that over 50,000 then contribute to art in public places uh, to be able to distill from the moment when a CIP comes through with the estimation of the uh, construction costs to the actual and to be able to distill that down for us. So I'm working on it and I'm learning a lot about fancy databases. Needless to say, these are some pictures of our civic center building. And as you may or may not know, depending on how long you've been in Longmont, that the uh, civic center mall was not always uh, an inside building. That in fact, those four buildings uh, each stand on their own piers, each have their own uh, uh, foundation, if you will. And the building itself is quite precarious. And so I met with the facilities person who is underway of that of that remediation and uh, the options of putting a um, sculpture on the plaza or even adding some mosaic uh, really is not possible because of weight limitations. And to the point where in the, what you can and cannot see um, in the upper left, there's the portion of the banners that is closest to us and then there's the portion of the banners that is further away. And the portion of the banners that's further away above them are some solar panels that are nearing the end of their life. And so facilities is considering updating those panels in some amount of time that is not now. Uh, so talking about even taking these pieces down and putting something back up, the installation uh, would need to be to the pound. They really need to understand the exact weight. So the idea of putting something back up, even something suspended, it's actually a larger conversation uh, than we can even discuss here right now. So the point that was brought in is the bed that has a very hard time growing plants successfully. Uh, as you walk up from the garage, and that is also very visible from council chambers, highly visible for public who attends and comes to the space is actually slab. And so as we consider utilizing funds from the CIP, from the Civic Center Project, addressing that space would be very appropriate. In addition, the facilities folks let me know that on the 
corner of Third and Kimbark. And this is a very bad Google grab. It's the best that I had that's not under snow right now. But needless to say, um, that corner, uh, because it is not on the plaza itself, but is uh, at ground, uh, could also be a, a very prominent place for some, some sort of installation and sculpture. And I'm still working with uh, city management in talking about the sign and even uh, above, I don't have a picture of it here, but uh, from that west side, so from that second picture, the upper right, just to the left, it says city of Longmont. It's used often as our banner, but then there's a very large, very beige blank arc. Uh, so that could potentially uh, be placed for something that doesn't have weight attached to it. I'm, I'm still waiting on some answers that way. So um, more to come when it comes to understanding the amount of funds that the CIP brought to art in public places. Uh, but I do think that continuing to address the, the, the banners and how the commission wants to go forward on that um, is necessary. Um, I thought of something really quickly. You know, that east side of the building where I think it's a planner now used to be a fountain. And I think I shared with you when I was a kid, we were so poor, we used to go swim in the fountain and it had beautiful lights and colors. And we thought it was a swimming fountain. We were probably seven or eight years old, but that's that same east side. And guess what? It hasn't changed except the fountain is gone. I, certainly um, I was gonna, I was gonna say, um, in in some ways that um, that stuff maybe doesn't look that faded, but if you see it in real life, I don't know. It has this like wrinkled. The material itself looks like it's just not solid, and it looks outdated. I don't know how else to explain it. You need to go see it, you know, in person yeah, to I really agree, understand. Totally. And however, having said that, as Angela said, that is that that building is so plain. It's all monocolored, and it really needs something. And those banners, in that wet regard, were wonderful at one time, but um, unfortunately, they just they look dusty all the time. I don't know how else to explain Those it. Those colors have faded. You're totally right. And you have to think, I was just thinking, wow, 98. My son was two years old. He's 26. So I think those are things to think about. It's This is where a lot of folks who might not ever be exposed to art in public places will get the opportunity. I mean, they pay, I mean, they pay their bills. Some folks don't pay their bills online. They don't have checkbooks. They go in and pay for cash. If we could catch their attention, there's another option to grab audiences that we haven't grabbed before. So Angela, are you saying that if we take that out due to weight restrictions, we might not be able to put anything back? It will absolutely need to go through the facilities. And as I understand, understanding what the installation method would be, uh, would be very necessary. In addition, if removing that piece can in some way, and this is what Holly was alluding to when she said, uh, reasons that the city might remove something based upon infrastructure, if those more efficient and sustainable um, solar panels would benefit from the weight of the work. Again, we're talking like not that much weight, but it actually is enough that it might make a difference. So uh, I think the best way forward is just to consider the work and to do the work uh, and to consider the banners purely based on aesthetics, date, impact, going and visiting those pieces and really getting your own feedback and, and understanding if we need to take a community view, um, what the best path forward is independent of the solar panels. And I will continue to work with facilities to understand um, their desires. And yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's complicated. And I know- Before we go to Andrea, I just wanna let you know, we have 15 minutes left on our scheduled agenda. 
So, and Susan Horowitz and Jennifer Miller both. Yeah, if you're yeah, if you're fine with I, if you're fine with going over, that's the way, that's okay. But I just wanted to let you all know that, Andrea. All right, and I'll be real quick. Uh, the other thing uh, that was mentioned was um, reaccession, placing it somewhere else. And again, I'm. It's kind of site specific, and I. I mean, we can we can discuss it further, but um, it it is site specific, and I don't think that would work. I think it just needs to be laid to to rest. <laughs> so Susan Horowitz had her hand up for a long time. Um, I said Susan, and I was muted. Sorry, Susan. All right. Um, so, yeah, just um, to say, I think what you need to do is take a minute and go see it uh, because the photographs are quite deceiving um, and make a judgment for yourself. That's all. Just take a minute, bop in, look around, walk out. I agree. Thank you very much, Susan. Who else had feedback that I missed? I apologize. Uh, Jennifer. Well, I agree. I think that everyone should go look at it if you possibly can have an inclination to. As, as textile artist myself, I just don't think this kind of art is meant to last forever. But I also, and, I, and given that I have learned tonight how precarious and unique this Civic Center bu building is, I just find it to be very... Um, kind of stultified and stagnant feeling when I'm in there. I never see anyone in there except for the person who's sometimes working the info booth. And um, I just feel like the energy is very stuck in there. And if we're going to do anything, I would like to see something make it more lively and more interactive and more of a destination. But given that, I mean, that's what I would like to see. But hey, maybe Jennifer, have you ever can. been there at the end of the month? Or <laughs> I haven't no, and no. I usually do Think take I do take know. my power bill down there, but I usually put it in the box across the street. So go if you all want to see some action, go um, towards like most city bills are due around the sixth of the month. Go and visit. You will see lines. Okay. Even during COVID, it's it's quite um, quite interesting. Gets, so okay, it gets we more really live. We have an audience there. But I would like to see it liven up and modernize and become more contemporary. So just quickly, I do think that there is a real opportunity aside from the banner situation for an asset of art in public places in a different place. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm investigating the CIP. I do think that I'll have a solid number and certainly the budget and the fund can afford it. Um, and so consideration of those spaces, um, I look forward to bringing something back to you uh, next month with that. And if everyone in, over the course of the month can take the time to go and visit if you can, and I will hear something back from the conservator who did the work in 2009. I've also asked if she will uh, kindly do an assessment or how much it would cost for her to do an assessment. So I think we'll get quite a bit back next month. Okay. Angela, is the weight limit only from hanging from the ceiling or from anywhere within the building? The whole building. There are very, per, very specific places, the elevator shaft and that one place that is on slab. Um, other than that, it's a weight limit issue. Okay. I, I'd want to say something. I do want to thank everyone for their comments and uh, participation in this because it was on my list to uh, check out for conservation. So thank you. <laughs> I don't think people coming into the city building should be, should be confronted with a faded and degraded artwork to represent the city necessarily. Couldn't agree more, Cindy. I think again, I've said this and if we're going to be, if you're gonna start looking at things from an equity lens, we have folks from our community that would not see art and maybe they'll, something will catch their eye when they come in to pay their utility bill. Um, you know, I've had to go in there and make payments 
You know, can you, I set up a payment plan. Can you help me? Cause I, I can't pay this bill. And they're really willing to work. But if they saw something that brightened their lives and you all contributed to that, wouldn't that be so exciting? I get look, see silly things like that make me really excited. Any other feedback on that? You all have done some amazing work. Thank you so much. And we will all pop in there. I wish we could all go pop in there together. But soon, soon. Okay. All right, I'm gonna cook with gas in nine minutes. You ready? Put on, put on your flyers. Okay, yeah, here bronze, we go. Bronze, is that, you're saying bronze, right? Bronze, here we go. Ooh. So 2018, our, bronze, our last bronze treatment was underway with Pat Kipper. He is uh, internationally known and lives in Loveland, Colorado. He and I have spoken about the current assessment of the work that is $1,900. Uh, I would like for you to consider us approving the $1,900 for the present works on the docket. That said, I know that we have two bronze works that have been added since then. I would really like for him to do an assessment of all of the work that is bronze and come back to us uh, if there are added pieces that are losing their patina or need a wax treatment. I'm bringing this to you via Eileen, who is our registrar and was unable to make it tonight, but in the quick and dirty way, um, that's pretty much it. So really what's on the table is that we approve the $1,910 that Pat Kipper has done in the past to assess the list that he has. And then at B, ask him to assess the rest of the bronze and come back to us with any additional funds for that maintenance. So um, moved. We need to have a motion, please, from what- How one? many so pieces are we, we talking to, about? Yeah, I'm sorry, you do have to restate it. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Cindy. How many Hold pieces on. are we talking about? It's more than a handful. Um, if you would like to push this to next month, which is no problem, I can send ex the exact list. I mean, if it's if it's five pieces, nineteen hundred dollars seems a little high. If it's twenty five pieces, nineteen hundred dollars seems incredibly cheap. Sure. So I can say that Pat Kipper went through an RFQ and was our preferred vendor for bronze services. Um, up until the moment when his contract expired. And that was the same, sorry, I'm Googling at the same time I'm talking, which I can never do. So whatever his standard list was, here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten. And it seems that between hot wax and cold wax, they average between a hundred a piece. Manilda obviously was expensive with four hundred dollars because she's multiple components and she's a hot wax treatment. Um, yeah, so it's really up to you. Uh, I think nineteen hundred dollars is cheap either way. I yeah. think it's really reasonable. I think it's, I think it's completely reasonable. I um, can I move that we agree to pay. His name is Bill. That we agree to have the, the uh, assessment and treatment of our bronze pieces looked at by this gentleman for $1,900 plus whatever he needs for the next two, for the for the other two. Do we have a, you, a rough estimate, Angela? Like, would it be another night? I mean, we have it's an, it's an average between $100 and $400 per piece, $400 being Manilda, and she's our expensive one. Obviously, the Statue of Liberty, because of its age, is a little more expensive. Really? But I, to just approve the 1900 for the uh, the pieces that he has on his list and then he'll bring us back an estimate for the rest so cindy is that your motion thank you so much that was good yes that that would be my motion so good we have a second oh thank you peter so um all in favor all opposed the motion passes thank you very much boy that was good angela I tried. And then new business, really nothing of that we haven't talked about. Um, administrator's report. I did have um, Newport News, Virginia, 
come to me and was very excited about our shock art program and picked my brain for an hour today. Um, so y'all should be super proud of how uh, the rest of the you know nation is looking at that program as a model. So congratulations to you. And I, I used to live in Newport News and they need you really? an arts program. <laughs> So no thank way. you for doing that. Oh, oh no, I mean, you know where to let here. them know. Hmm. Yeah, I spoke with their uh, city manager and their basically their director of operations. They're looking at graffiti abatement, and I gave them every resource under the sun, and they were extremely appreciative. But again, they were highly complimentary of Longmont. So awesome. excellent. So awesome. And then commissioner's comments, and that's it. I don't have any. This who has comments? Susan, you have Susan, Andrea, a minute apiece. Let's go. And then Randy, another minute. Um, there's a thing on Facebook. I'll send the link to Angela, and she can send it out to everybody. But it's a guy who walked all the streets of Longmont. Yes, it's in the paper today. On yeah. Uh, and he talks about one of his memorable moments is AIPP work all over the city, Talk yeah. about, um, all of it. And he did it at night mostly, but so he wants to go back and see so much more of it in the daylight. And if you get the paper, um, you could probably on Facebook it, but I get the digital version. It's on the front page of today's newspaper. It was great. Yeah. Awesome. Randy and then Andrea. I just wanted to ask Aaron if that sticker giant thing contest is over. It's not over? I posted it. I didn't see She's it. She's unmuting. She's going. Sorry. I lost everybody. No, I don't think it's over. I think this is the last week. In fact, tomorrow might be the last day to apply. Check us out on social media. Go to stickergiant.com and search for sticker contest. But I know... Um, our social media crew posted something this week on Instagram. I'm not on Facebook, but check out our Instagram if you're on there. Okay. I'm um, not on there, but my son is. So cool. Yeah. Great. Thank LinkedIn. you very much. That's a good point. I, I thought it was exciting. Aaron, thanks for bringing that to the forefront. We love that. Andrea. Um, I just wanted to comment about um, inclusiveness um, and diversity one way we can help with that is with our application forms. Um, that's, a, that's like the first line of how we get people in is our application. So maybe we need to come up with a strategy of where we're um, getting applications. Usually we get it on the city streets and festivals, for example. And then the other um, aspect is it is our city board, Marsha Martin, um, it, you, you guys are choosing them. U ultimately, you're choosing us. And um, that's just another area that we have to kind of focus on as well. Great point, Andrea. And it's where we're going. One other thing I'm learning is that we've got to present ourselves to folks that we would not present ourselves normally. Not everybody's yep. going to come to a street fair, but they might go to another festival that we have in town. That's awesome. Great point. Anybody mm -hmm. else on that commissioner report? Oh, y'all are so awesome. Okay. Um, we got commissioner's report. Uh, oh my goodness. Hold on. Any last moments? Because I'll be really excited if we can. Oh, Angela, go ahead. I'm timing you. No. Oh. What do you have, my friend? Nothing. We're good. All right. I motion to adjourn at 7.59 with that packed, packed agenda. How awesome was that? <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I'm very, Thank very Thank you. Well, I won't see you next month, but I will see you. Um, I believe my last stint will be in May. Um, so hopefully we can all get to celebrate um, maybe in June or July. We were talking about that today. So have a great month. And um, please um, follow up with the things Angela talked about. And I look forward to seeing you in May. And Randy will be your uh, leader. And I'm sure she'll get a lot Angela, of support. Call me. I will. <laughs> Um, Angela, but we have a whole month for that, friend. Uh, yeah, my son's getting married. I'm not quite, I'd rather be at an AAP meeting, to tell you the truth. Enjoy your wedding. Sounds really fun. 
It's going to be crazy. Yes. Take care, everyone. God bless. Have Thank a good you, night. Amy. Happy wedding. We did Thank good. Thank you, everyone. Everyone did great tonight. Thank you. Okay, girl, should I stop this recording? Yes. Okay, stop recording. Do you want to stop recording?